Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. I am on, as I can tell. It's great to hear you fellowshipping with one another, and uh, what a blessing it is to be able to join together and welcome one another and encourage one another with the good things that the Lord has done for us through Jesus Christ. And that's why we gather together each week is because the Lord Jesus has been so kind to us and has given us a salvation which is rich and full and everlasting, and it's a, it's a joy to be a part of his family. Well, uh, my name is Peter. I have the joy of serving as a pastor here in Christ Fellowship. If you are visiting with us this morning, we're very glad that you're here. Uh, hopefully, you received one of these when you came through the door. This is a guest card. Uh, if you did not receive one of these, you could see me after the service this morning. I'd be happy to get one to you. Basically, this is a way that you can fill this card out, let us know a little bit about you in ways that we can perhaps pray for you or care for you, and that will help us, you know, just kind of connect with you a little bit more uh, and possibly let you know more about what's going on in the life of our church, which is something that we would love to do. There are also people that are joining us this morning via our live stream in Building 3000 and also sitting outside uh, so that you have room to sit in here, and uh, we just want to welcome you if you are sitting in one of our overflow areas. Thank you so much for being willing to serve our people in this way, serve us as a church in this way, by uh, allowing there to be room here for others to gather. We look forward to fellowshipping with you after the service this morning. We're going to do just a few things this morning before we really transition to the heart of our service time. And the first is I want to give away a few books. All right, so, so we do this. Why do we give away good books? It's because we want to grow as disciples of Jesus, uh, and the Bible is our key textbook for that, and yet God has taught uh, men and women good things about himself, and they've written them down in books, and we want to hear what the Lord has taught them as well. Uh, this is a book called How Can I Find Someone to Disciple Me? It's by uh, Garrett Kell, really faithful, very brief treatment of how you can find someone who will invest in you spiritually so you can grow as a follower of Jesus. Uh, if you'd be interested in reading this book for free, you just have to raise your hand and we'll give it to you. Right over there. Thanks, Dan. To Mitchell, right over there. The next book is by Greg Gilbert. It is Why Trust the Bible. This is a really helpful treatment into why the, the Bible you have in your lap is a trustworthy and reliable record of who God is and what he has done to bring salvation. Uh, it's well-researched. It's also really clear. And if you'd like to think more about why you can trust the Bible as God's word, you raise your hand. It doesn't matter if you're a guest. Yep, we've got one over there. Right in the middle. Right over there, Russell. All right, now if you want this book and you read it, you get an A because it is an excellent book but it's a thicker book, okay? So it requires some thought. This is the church, the gospel made visible. It is an unbelievably important book because the, the church is what Christ is building in the world. Well, what does the Bible say about how the church is supposed to function? Who are its officers? What does it mean to be a member? Uh, how is it led? How does it grow? Uh, Mark Dever does a great job of helping us think through all of those. So with that kind of advertisement at the beginning, if you would like to, oh, there we go. Uh, I love a church that loves to read. So please read those books, enjoy those books. I hope you're edified by those. By those. Now we have uh, three announcements. Now if you, you have your bulletin that was given to you, uh, obviously there's several announcements we want you to pay attention to, but we just want to highlight three this morning. The first is that our youth group is starting this evening from five to seven here. So if you have children in ages uh, fifth grade to 12th grade, they're welcome to come. Uh, there'll be a time of food. There will be some fun games as well. But really the heart of what we're trying to do is to teach them the truth of God's word. And they're beginning a new study this evening called What is the Gospel? Bryce Rader, our pastor for discipleship, is going to be beginning that series this evening on what is the gospel. That will be here from five to seven for all fifth to 12th graders. Hope you guys are able to come to that. Next Sunday at 6 p.m., uh, all young adults. Uh, young adults is uh, defined as 18 to 30, and you are invited to enjoy a time of fellowship that's going to take place down in Newport News. It's going to take place at Reformation Christian Fellowship, and really what this is is this is a group of churches, uh, the Pillar Churches for Hampton Roads, and their young adults get together for fellowship, for times of enjoying, uh, just spending time together, getting to know one another. 
and encouraging one another as followers of Jesus. There's going to be, pizza will be provided. Uh, they are requesting $5 to kind of offset the price of that. But if you would like to come to that, uh, Young Adults Fellowship, uh, you can see Josiah Monfreda, our church administrator, and he'd be more than happy to make sure you have everything you need to do that. Last uh, is for the ladies. Last Sunday, one of the things we talked about as we looked at God's Word together is the importance of the church demonstrating a, a genuine love for one another. That that's uh, the great evidence, the final evidence that we belong to Jesus. And one of the ways that you as uh, women can grow in your love for one another is by spending time together. And one of the ways that you can spend time together is by involving yourself in the Bible studies that are going to be beginning uh, next week. So it'll be, begin the week of September 10th. There are several groups meeting throughout the week in different homes at different times. There's really a group for everyone. And we would love for you to come and participate in that. All of the groups are going to be looking at the book of Ephesians, which is a glorious book. If you want to participate in this study, uh, you can sign up in the foyer. So kind of right behind me, there's a table where you can sign up. And then folks that are uh, organizing this will get in contact with you. And then you'll need to also get the Ephesians study journal and a study guide. Those are available for $10. And you can find them on the book study resource table over here to my left. All right, those are all of the announcements we have for this morning. Let us turn our hearts now to God's word in just a moment. But first, let's just kind of quiet our hearts and prepare ourselves to worship God together this morning. Exodus 34, verses 5 to 7. The Lord came down in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed his name, the Lord. The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord. The Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Let's pray. Lord God, you are holy and good. And as we gather together this morning, we're mindful of the fact that you are the one who has always existed. And we are grateful for the reality that you are gracious and compassionate towards us in Christ. As we gather to worship you this morning through songs and prayer and singing and hearing your word proclaimed, we pray that you would be with us. Empower our worship to you and make us like Christ through this time together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, if able, please stand. I'm going to read for you some of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the sea, though its waters roars and foams and the mountains quake with his turmoil, nations rage, kingdoms topple, the earth melts when he lifts his voice. The Lord of armies is with us, the God of Jacob, is our stronghold. As believers in Christ, we are the spiritual descendants of Abraham and the true Israel. This song is a call to Israel for true bravery through fierce trials. Let us sing to God praise that reminds us that the Lord of armies is with us. Psalm 46, Lord of hosts. Oh, come behold the works of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease. Almighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire. Appears. 
this next song that we're about to sing is about the rider on the white horse of Revelation 19, fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament, Christ himself in his second coming. He is the fulfillment of scripture, a lion from the tribe of Judah, whose coming will be like a roaring lion. Let's continue singing, Lion of Judah. seated, could you please come forward and read to us out of Daniel. Thank you, Matt. This is a reading from the prophet Daniel, chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind also was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one resembling a bear. And it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. After this I kept looking, and behold, another one like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. 
It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boasts. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were opened. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain, and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, John. And church, if able, please stand. How wonderful it is to be able to praise the Son of Man that was prophesied in Daniel. In Philippians, we read, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. In Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let us remind ourselves of our bankrupt, our pauper positioning before the King of Kings. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, and the only good things we do come from God alone. Let us continue worshiping, humbly singing, yet not I, but through Christ in me. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy. My righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and is done. 
The immense gift of being one of the saved is staggering. This next song starts with powerful questions. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? With wonder at being his chosen. Let's sing all the verses except for verse 2 of And Can It Be? Born me who caused his pain and 
seated. And those children participating in Truth Seekers, you're now dismissed for your classes. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Bryce Rayner. I serve here at Christ Fellowship as a pastor. I just want to say how um, humbled I was this morning to see so many of your faces come to our equipping hour. I just think that shows a lot about our church, that we desire to want to grow in theological knowledge, and I praise God for that. So we now come to the part of our service where we'll have a pastoral prayer and so we praise God and we confess our sin and we pray for the world and our country. And so let's do that now as we go before the Lord. Father in heaven, we come before you praising you this morning for your mercy towards us. You are compassionate and gracious. You do not deal with us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your faithful love to those who fear you. As far as the east is from the west, so far you have removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, Lord, you have compassion on those who fear you. And the mercy that you show us every single day is difficult to even fathom. Our faith from start to finish flows out of the mercy that you have for sinners like us. This salvation that we have came as a direct result of mercy through your spirit. And you continue to give us mercy every single day as redeemed people. Your mercy meets us in our sin and it never leaves us. How can we not but praise you for the mercy that you have bestowed upon us? Well, we've been given so much mercy from you. God, but many of us this past week, we failed to show that mercy to others. God, forgive us. Some of us have been so self-absorbed in our hearts that we were only fixating on our wants and needs. We never even had the thought to reach out to a hurting member, check on a grieving friend, or text an encouraging word to a suffering sibling. God, some of our hearts might have been so hardened to the needs of the body that we didn't even pray for anybody around us. We simply just prayed for ourselves. God, we didn't grieve with those who were grieving. We only kept our eyes on our own problems. God, you have shown us incredible, undeserved, and amazing mercy. God, we ask that you would help us reflect that very mercy to others. God, we were in such a pitiful state, yet you had pity on us. Should we not also have pity on others? God, help us be merciful, for you are merciful. And Father, we are praising you for your mercy that you have shown to the country of Mongolia. God, in 1989, it was believed that there were only four Christians in that country. But in 2010, there were almost 40,000 believers worshiping you in hundreds of churches. Look at your mercy. We praise you for that. We praise you for the work that you've done in this country. And we ask that your gospel would continue to go forth, that it wouldn't just be 40,000, that it would be 80,000, 100,000, that more and more people would come to know you. God, we pray that you would develop pastors of the churches there. God, allow them to disciple more leaders so that they might be raised up. Um, to go out and plant more churches. God, we pray for the eight Bible colleges there. We pray that those Bible colleges would remain um, fixated on your word, that they would not move away from your word, and that you would use those Bible colleges to equip pastors to preach the whole counsel of God. 
God, we praise you for the mercy that you've shown on Mongolia. Well, Father, we pray that you would have mercy on our own country. God, we pray that Christians would continue to preach the gospel in peace. God, that is your mercy for us. And we ask that that would be something that would keep going, that we would be able to gather as a church, that we would be able to do street evangelism, that we'd, we would be able to go into schools and do good news Bible clubs, Father. That is your grace and mercy on our country. And I pray that that would remain. God, we ask that religious freedom would still reign. God, have mercy on us. God, we pray that Christian parents would be able to parent their kids in their best entrance. God, that's your grace and mercy on us that we're able to um, show our kids, that we're able to teach our kids the gospel. Father, we pray that that would continue. Have mercy on our country. And God, we ask that you would have mercy on our body. Satan wants nothing more than to wreck everything. Satan wants nothing more than to take our lampstand away for us to put a basket over the light that is shining in Williamsburg. Father, may that not be. I pray that you would have mercy on us, specifically um, concerning our unity. God, I pray that you would keep us one. I pray that there would not be division or dissension, Father, that you would allow us to continue to love one another, bear one another's burdens. God, that we would um, be able to just um, help one another follow you. God, keep us one. I pray that no gossip or slander or anything would come in to cause division. Have mercy on us. And Father, we pray that you would have mercy on us at this very moment as your word goes forth. God, give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see. Father, I pray that you would speak to us. I pray Pray that your spirit would accompany your word and the power of your word would transform us. God, help us to be people that hear your word and do your word. Have mercy on us. In Christ's name, amen. If you have God's word and you're able, stand to your feet for the reading of Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When he entered Capernaum again after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many people gathered together that there was no more room, not even in the doorway, and he was speaking the word to them. They came to him, bringing a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they were not able to bring him to Jesus because of the crowds, they removed the roof above him. And after digging through it, they lowered the mat on which the paralytic was lying. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right away, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were thinking like this within themselves and said to them, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But so that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately he got up, took the mat, and went out in front of everyone. As a result, they were all astounded and gave glory to God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. This is God's word. You may be seated. Have you ever heard the saying, God helps those who help themselves. Have you ever heard that saying, God helps those who help themselves? 
You might have heard it preach from a pulpit. You might have even heard your favorite politician use it in a campaign speech. There's many that believe this statement stems from a biblical principle. And actually, there's statistics to back this up. Barna Research did this. They did a survey, and they determined that 68% of born-again Christians believe that this is a biblical statement. And the general American population is even higher at 75%. But where did this originate from? Where did this saying originate from? Well, as I was studying this week, I knew, that it origin- I knew that Ben Franklin used it in his Poor Richard's Almanac, but I actually didn't know where Ben Franklin got it. And so again, as I was studying this week, he actually got it from Aesop's Fables, Hercules and the Wagner. And so if y'all don't know that story with Hercules and the Wagner, this man is taking a wagon and he's going along this road and it's raining, right? And the road is very wet And so as he's taking it along this road, he gets over the road and he gets stuck on the side. And without ever even trying to do anything, trying to push the wagon out of the mud, what does he do? Well, he calls out to Hercules, come help me, Hercules. And then Hercules miraculously appears. And this is what he says to the man. He says, put your shoulder to the wheel and urge your horses Do you think you can move the wagon by simply looking at it and whining about it? Hercules will not help unless you make some effort to help yourselves. Well, then the farmer took that rebuke and he immediately put his hand and pushed it out. And the fable ends with the words, heaven helps those that help themselves. Heaven helps those that help themselves. Now, my question is for you, Does Aesop's fable hit on a biblical principle? Was Benjamin Franklin correct that God helps those that help themselves? Well, I want to say, absolutely not. (laughs) Other religions would without a doubt affirm this mantra, but Christianity is very different. It must be different, because if God helps those who only help themselves then we are all in very deep trouble. We are incapable of helping ourselves. We actually have an inability to move towards God. The wagon will be forever stuck in the mud if it's up to us. However, the uniqueness of Christianity is the fact that everything centers around God's grace in the gospel. The message of the gospel, as we'll see in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, is that God helps those who cannot help themselves. Brothers and sisters, that's great news for you and me. Jesus, the Son of Man, not only has authority over sins, but he moves towards the helpless and the hopeless to do what we cannot do. Forgive us from our sins. Amen. I have two points for us coming from Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 this morning. First, Jesus' colossal claim, and second, Jesus' airtight argument. So Jesus' colossal claim and Jesus' airtight argument. Now, before we get into verse 1, I want to remind you of where we've been in Mark. Chapter 1 opens with the words, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now what Mark's going to do for the entire book is help us answer the question, what does it mean that Jesus is the Son of God? And in chapter 1, verses 1 through 13, we're introduced to Jesus the Messiah, who has come to bring a new and a better exodus, freeing God's people from the bondage of this evil age. But how will that happen? How will the Messiah bring out this recreation? It will be through the kingdom of God. He starts his ministry with the very message in chapter 1, verse 14. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe in the good news. God's redemptive rule and reign has arrived. Recreation is at hand. The new exodus is here. The reverse of the curse is being lifted. The king is here with his kingdom. But please hear me, the king will not come, the kingdom will not come without opposition. Starting in Mark 2, we're going to see heavy opposition from Israel's religious elite. 
we will actually see five different accounts of opposition from Mark chapter 2 to Mark chapter 3, verse 6. The crown is not going to come without the cross. And we see in this section the embryonic stage of opposition that will eventually lead to Jesus' death. So to our first point, Jesus' colossal claim. Look with me at verse 1 of Mark chapter 2. Mark writes these words. When he entered Capernaum again after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many people gathered together that there was no more room, not even in the doorway, and he was speaking the word to them. Mark mentions Capernaum in chapter 1, verse 21, for the first time when Jesus comes into the synagogue on the Sabbath to teach the people. If you remember from my last sermon, Capernaum was a small town located on the north shore of Galilee. And in Mark chapter 2, verse 1, Jesus returns to Capernaum after, Sunday, after some days, and the town gets word that Jesus is at home. That probably means he's at Peter's house, and they start to come in. Now, verse 2 fills us in that Jesus' home was very similar to my home, a place where rest and relaxation are non-existent. <laughs> now, the source of my chaos is my children, who I want to tell you all that I love so much, but Jesus was slightly different. The text says this, So many people gathered together that there was no more room, not even in the doorway. The source of the chaos was the crowds. Jesus' house was packed full of people. It seemed like the entire town was present, leaving the ushers to throw up their hands saying, standing room only is done. You cannot even enter the doorway. There are so many people here. Well, let me give you a word of encouragement. I know our church is kind of like Jesus' house right now. Let's be honest. It's packed full of people that it might actually get uncomfortable some Sundays as you try to find a seat, as you try to check your kids into the children's ministry, as you just want to use the bathroom, right? <laughs> it could get crazy. I know it can be frustrating, but brothers and sisters, in the Lord's kindness, you manage the commotion of Sunday mornings so well. You do it with joy. The sacrifice has not gone unnoticed, and we as elders could not be more thankful for your faithfulness as you gather each and every Sunday. All right, I want to help us bring ourselves into the story here. Let's just say hypothetically, you go to your house, and at two in the afternoon, you go to your door, and your whole neighborhood is at your front door, and they all start filing in. Like, what would you immediately do if that happened? I think you would start to get out your best dishes, right? I think you would probably get your cups. I think you'd probably get these platters so that you can serve food and drink. We'd probably get out games, maybe cornhole in the back, or put on the football game on the TV so that people can watch the game. If this were to happen to us, we would immediately go into serving mode. But my question is, what did Jesus do? Because this actually happened to Jesus. What did he do when everybody filed into his house? Well, the text says he was speaking the word to them. This phrase right here defines the essence of Jesus's ministry. We saw in my last sermon in chapter 1, verse 38, where Jesus emphatically said, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I have come. Why did Jesus come? To preach the word. It's crystal clear throughout Mark's gospel that healing and performing miracles was not Jesus' primary ministry objective. It was to bring the good news of the kingdom of God so people might enter through repentance and faith. Well, many of us in our congregation spent this last summer during our equipping our time watching discipleship documentaries. It was such a sweet time. By God's grace, I think we learned so much. And one of the movies that we watched was the American Gospel. It chronicles how the Word of Faith movement has distorted the gospel. And it shows example after example of these faith healers like Todd White on the streets talking to unbelievers. And they'll explicitly say, 
man, I'm not coming to preach to you, man. I'm not here to bring the word to you. I'm just here to show you the love of God through these healings and miracles. Well, friends, I want to tell you that that's anti-gospel and that's anti-Christianity. I want you to turn with me right quick. I'm getting excited here. Acts 14.3. I think this is so important when we're thinking about miracles and healings. Acts 14.3. If you're thinking about miracles and why they existed during this time, what was the purpose of them? I think Acts 14.3 actually gives us the answer. So Acts is just a couple books after Mark. Acts 14.3. So Paul is on his first missionary journey, and the text reads this. So they stayed there a long time and spoke boldly for the Lord, who testified to the message of his grace by what? By enabling them to do signs and wonders. What did the healings, what did the miracles accomplish? They had a specific purpose, to testify to the word of God, to prop up the word of God, to enable the word of God to go Fourth, well, you can go back to Mark 2, because I think you can dwindle down Jesus's entire purpose of his ministry in the phrase, he was speaking the word to them. Jesus's ministry was focused on the proclamation of the word. Well, what happens next is one of the most memorable accounts in all of the gospels. Four friends and the paralytic, they want to drop in at Jesus' house party. But in order to enter, they have to raise the roof, which means they couldn't have been Baptist. <laughs> that joke went right over your head, kind of like the roof. All right, so we're back in verse 3. Mark writes this. They came to him bringing a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they were not able to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after digging through it, they lowered the mat on which the paralytic was lying. Notice the relentlessness of the four friends attempting to bring their paralyzed friend to Jesus. The four friends did not grab a servant so they could get Jesus. No, they brought their friend to Jesus. All the crowds would not halt the four friends' ambition to see Jesus. After finding the doorway jammed, the four friends took the stairs up to the roof. When well, Palestine during the first century, homes normally had one story and they had stairs that were leading up on the side to the roof. And the roof was a place that people ate, they prayed, they just hung out. It was kind of like a deck. And the way that it was constructed, there was reeds and sticks and then there was a lot of mud that was packed on top of that. And then somebody came with a roller to roll down all the mud to get it very hard and sturdy. So they go on to this roof. And after not finding an opening, the four friends decided to make their own. They were determined to get their friend to Jesus because they were determined that Jesus could do something about their friend's condition. Well, college students and high schoolers, I want to make a very quick application for you. The application is, choose your friends wisely. In his Thoughts for Young Men, J.C. Ryle helpfully writes this. He says, there is no telling the harm that is done by associating with godless friends. The devil has few better helps in ruining a man's soul. Your closest friends, they will inevitably influence you. They will either bring you to Jesus or they will bring you away from Jesus. I just want to encourage you for your closest friends to be friends with God. I think that is going to help you in your sanctification. Well, once the four friends opened the roof and lowered the paralytic down to Jesus, verse 5 tells us this. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. I want us to observe four things about this colossal claim to the paralytic. First observation, the reason for the statement. The text says, if you notice, seeing their faith. The reason for the statement sprung from the, sprung from the faith of many. It didn't spring from the faith of one. 
I'm assuming it was all five of them. I think Jesus gives this statement because seeing the four friends and the paralytic, I'm not convinced that the paralytic was brought against his will. It seems like everyone showed great faith, and Jesus was clearly impressed with their disruption. It's one thing to show up early to get a seat, but removing a roof and lowering a friend down is a completely different thing. And Jesus does not rebuke them for their disturbance, but he commends them for their faith. Their understanding of Jesus drove them to sacrifice everything to get in front of Jesus. The four friends and the paralytic's faith are evidently on display. And this faith is seen through what? It's seen through works. Our next observation is the surprise of the statement. If you had never heard this account, what would you guess that comes next after the friends lower their paralyzed friend down to Jesus? Well, you would guess that Jesus did what? That he would heal him physically. It's downright shocking the words that Jesus utters. Because it's not get up, take up your mat and walk. It's what? It's your sins are forgiven. Think about it. Nothing in this text suggests that these friends or the paralytic were looking for forgiveness. Physical healing was their aim. But Jesus granted this man something better. He granted him spiritual healing. Jesus looked past this man's immediate need and gave him what he needed the most. That is forgiveness of sins. Well, our third observation, the boldness of the statement. Even more shocking than giving him what he didn't ask for, Jesus himself boldly forgives this man for his sins. Jesus is indicating that this man has sinned against him. That's a pretty bold claim. But how? This man has presumably never met Jesus. How could this man sin against somebody he's never seen? would be like this. So just hypothetically, I finish the sermon. I'm sitting or standing over there. Mark Simon, I'm using you. You come over there. I think he's going to tell me good sermon as he shakes my hand. But instead of doing that, he slaps me on the face. And then right after he slaps me, hear me, a Hilton employee comes from across the street and looks at Mark Simon and says, Mark Simon, your sin against Bryce is forgiven. I mean, that statement wouldn't make any sense. The Hilton employee wasn't the one who got slapped. The Hilton employee has no right to forgive Mark Simon for the sin committed against me. Now, my question for you this morning is this. How does Jesus have the right to forgive this man whom he has presumably never laid eyes on? Did this man actually sin against Jesus requiring forgiveness of sins? Well, Jesus says so right here. He says your sins are forgiven. But how is that? Because Jesus, the Messiah, is the Lord Almighty. Jesus right here is boldly affirming his deity. This passage is a great passage to point to if you ever encounter somebody that says Jesus was not divine. He's claiming divinity right here. Louis Burkhoff in his systematic theology said this, he said, the denial of Jesus' divinity is possible only for those who disregard the teachings of Scripture. For the Bible contains an abundance of evidence for the deity of Christ. You see, Jesus is declaring to this paralytic that he has sinned against him. But Jesus is also saying that I have authority over sins and I can forgive you. Well, finally, our last observation, the blessing of the statement. Jesus pronounces before everyone that this man's sins are forgiven. I want us to think for a moment about the gravity of this statement. The paralytic had an inability to cleanse himself. He had an inability to help himself or work to God. His outward condition uniquely showed his inward condition, that there was nothing that he could do to get to God. Yet Jesus extended to a paralyzed sinner God's full and complete pardon of sin. All this man's sin right here when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, had been wiped away in that very moment. Jesus gave him what he didn't know he needed, 
but in fact, he needed more than anything in the entire world. Although he still couldn't walk, the paralytic was the most blessed man in the entire crowd. Well, now I want to give us a couple of applications in light of verse 5. If you're not a Christian, I want you to know that you can receive the blessing of this statement this morning. Your sins can be, can be forgiven, but for your sins to be forgiven by a Savior, you need to first know that you have sinned against a Savior. See, this paralytic, Jesus was calling him a sinner to his face, saying, you are forgiven. And that's the same as you. You are a sinner before a holy God. You need your sins wiped away. But God can provide that very thing through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your sins can be cleansed. They can be gone. I'll tell you just a quick story. This was January 3rd, 2020. And I was sitting in the hospital. This was 24 hours after. Um, this was 24 hours after David Austin was born. I just got finished with an internship in D.C. I've come back to Memphis. I don't have a job. We just had a kid. I'm sitting on the hospital bed, and I'll never forget this for the rest of my life. But my phone had a notification, and I picked it up, and it was a bill of $2,200 from AWS, which is Amazon Web Services. I was toying with a server, so you can get on these servers, you have faster internet. Who knew that you actually had to turn them off or they would continue to bill you? I did not know that. So I didn't turn it off and it kept billing me $2,200. And I remember I reached out to AWS with this long email saying, I'll pay for some of it, but I don't think I can pay for all of it. Is there anything that you can do to help me? And I remember I was at my computer. This was like four days after David Austin was born. And I got an email and AWS said, I've taken care of it. Your whole debt is clear. Don't even worry about it. I understand the mistake. And I remember sitting there thinking, is this not a picture of the gospel? Is this not a picture of when Jesus Christ saves us? All our debt is gone. All our sins are forgiven. Friend, if you're a non-Christian this morning, you can experience that. But you have to repent and believe in Jesus. You have to cast yourself on Jesus who died for you, who took on the wrath of God and was raised three days later. If you look to him like my debt was cleared, your sin debt can be cleared. That's an amazing thought. I pray that you would do that this very morning. Well, Christian, you have been forgiven. So the application for you is quit fixating on your past sins. I think I certainly understand the paralysis that comes when you're randomly reminded of grievous sin that you committed in the past. Our memory of past failures, they honestly start to play like a movie, which immediately kind of brings this shame and guilt upon you we find ourselves thinking about the mistake. And as we keep thinking about the mistake, then we start to relive the mistake. And as we're reliving the mistake, then we tell ourselves we are the mistake. In an article on the Gospel Coalition, Jason Meyer helps us understand that the problem is not that we look back. The problem is that we did not look back far enough. He says this, I love this. He said, don't sit in your sin. Take it on a journey all the way back to the cross and see it nailed there. Then and only then will you be ready to move forward in the forgiving love of Christ. For those of you who struggle with these painful memories, I think Colossians 2.14 is a great verse that you should memorize. Paul says this in Colossians 2.14. He said, Jesus erased the certificate of debt. So what's the certificate of debt? It's this long sheet that has all of our sins on it. Everything that we've ever done is on this certificate of debt. And Paul says that he erased it. How did he erase it? Well, he goes on to say, with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it on a cross. 
look all the way back to Calvary where all your sins were nailed to the cross. Christian, Jesus' words to the paralytic are the same words to you. Son, your sins are forgiven. Daughter, your sins are forgiven. They're forgiven finally and fully and forever. Praise God for that grace. Well, a final application to our parents. What your kids need the most is not to be the best athlete in their class. It's not, the, it's not for them to be the valedictorian of their school. It's not even to be their, the best musician in their friend group. What your kids need more than anything in the world is forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. So make sure you keep preaching that truth to them. Keep preaching the gospel of grace so that they value Jesus more than any worldly success. I'll tell you a quick story about my last three weeks at night. So we do our family worship at night. And for the last three weeks, I think almost every night, I've just been reading our boys Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And every single night, when I get to verse 5, I'll ask Henry, Henry, what did Jesus say to the paralytic? And he looks at me and he goes, Dada, your sins are forgiven. And I said, Henry, why did he say that? And Henry will look at me and said, because that's what he needed more than anything. Do you see that simple gospel truth that we can preach to him? I encourage you, if you're thinking about what to do tonight in your family worship, go home and read your kids Mark 2, verses 1 through 12. It's a wonderful story. Even as you start to interact, like digging out the roof and all those things, your kids are going to love it. But even more than that, you're going to be able to preach them the gospel. And I'm praying that it bears fruit. Well, you might think that all the crowd would have been overwhelmed with joy with what just happened. But not everyone was thrilled to hear Jesus' declaration to the paralytic. Opposition quickly arose from some people inside the house. We come to our last point, Jesus' airtight argument. Look with me at verses 6 through 7. But some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? In my last sermon, we talked about the scribes. The scribes were those that were experts in the Old Testament. They knew everything about the Torah, and they were really known for their expertise because they really had the best seats everywhere they went. And it's kind of interesting to note that the scribes were actually in Jesus's house. Unlike the four friends and the paralytic, the scribes were seeing Jesus face to face. Now, these men did not externally, externally react to Jesus's declaration But the text says that they were questioning in their hearts. What does it mean that they were questioning in their hearts? When Mark uses heart, he's not referring to our vital organ. No, but as Basil of Caesarea said in the 4th century, the heart is the internal court of the soul. The heart is the internal court of the soul. Our hearts weigh all reality, attempting to make prudential judgments. Now, I want to say the theological statement that the scribes made at the end of verse 6 is absolutely correct. The Old Testament over and over reveals that God alone forgives sins. Peter read for us Exodus 34 at the beginning of the sermon where the Lord does what? He forgives iniquity, rebellion, and sin. And Nathan says to David after his grievous sin in 2 Samuel chapter 13, Chapter 12, verse 13, and the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. Again, the scribes knew their Bibles. They knew without a shadow of a doubt that God alone has the prerogative to take away sins. So they charged Jesus with blasphemy, which according to Leviticus 24, 16, was punishable by death. This was a serious charge by a serious group of people. Now, it's clear right here that the scribes were absolutely right in their theology. But I want you to know they were certainly wrong in their logic. The thinking is pretty straightforward. They said, all right, Jesus claims to forgive sins, and only God can forgive sins. So Jesus is committing blasphemy by claiming to be someone that he's not. 
and the charge of blasphemy from the religious leaders ultimately was the very charge that led Jesus to his death. As I was thinking about this controversy and why they reacted the way that they did, why was there so much hatred in their hearts? I came across this Sinclair Ferguson quote, and I thought it was so helpful. He says this. He said, the crux of the controversy was about the character of God. The religious leader said, God cannot come to us like this and do these things so humbly and graciously. Therefore, this man cannot be the son of God. They eventually crucified Jesus because they would not tolerate what his words and works revealed about the character of God, that he saves sinners. Jesus says, when you see me, you see the what? The Father. And the scribes did not like at all what they were looking at. Well, now think through this for just a second. Jesus experienced in this moment the very first opposition to his ministry. I realize it's not manifested outwardly, but the text says in verse 8 that Jesus, through his spirit, knew it exactly what they were thinking. He knows both the sins of the paralytic and he knows the thoughts of the scribes. Now, what was Jesus' response to this opposition? Did he shy away in fear? Did he retract his statement? Did he go over there and try to smooth it over with the religious elite? No, Jesus in all boldness replies to them in front of the whole crowd. You can see this in verse 8. Look with me. Jesus said, Why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, take up your mat, and walk. Now I want to say this is a difficult verse to understand. What argument is Jesus trying to make here? I've really wrestled with this text the entire week. I think we have an argument from lesser to greater. It's like he's saying, you don't believe me that this man's sins are forgiven. That's the easier thing to say, but it's actually the harder thing to prove. So now I'm going to make this paralytic walk. That's the harder thing to do because you have to visually prove it. The whole point of Jesus' argument is so everyone might know the easier thing was in fact accomplished. Now, I do want to preface this whole thing by saying this whole argument is solely based on visual proof to a skeptical audience. So let me say that again. This whole argument is based on visual proof to a skeptical, argument, to a skeptical audience. An argument from lesser to greater in the sense of real-time verification. If you've ever seen videos, or maybe some of you have been to faith healer revivals, really the only people that they bring up on stage are those who have invisible illnesses, an illness that is not outwardly visible to others, like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, or autoimmune disorders. If you ever glance at the crowd, and I promise you, this is one of the saddest scenes you'll ever see in your entire life. There are 50 to 100 people who have visible diseases out in the crowd, just waiting to come on stage, just waiting to be healed. But you never, ever see any of them go up on stage. Why is that? Because if they were to come up on stage, the faith healer's false theology and fraudulent activity would be exposed for all to see. But Jesus is not like these faith healers. Jesus is willing to back up his declaration of his forgiveness of sins with hard evidence saying, I have authority over sins. I also have authority over diseases. Look with me at verse 10. Jesus says this. He says, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home. Right off the bat, I want us to notice that Jesus refers to himself right here as the Son of Man. You see, this title calls us to hearken back to Daniel 7, which John Pottle read for us earlier where the Son of Man is presented to the Ancient of Days, that is, God the Father, and given dominion 
and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. This is Jesus' actual favorite title for himself. Again, it takes us back to Daniel 7, where we see a figure of great authority who will one day rule over all nations. This title clearly reveals that Jesus was both a real human, he was a son of man, but he also shares in the divine attributes with the Father, as we see in Daniel 7. Now, Jesus performs this visually harder miracle so that people may know that the Son of Man has authority over sins. Well, what does it mean that Jesus has authority over sins? Well, it simply means that Jesus has the right to do it. It's a picture of his sovereign lordship. He has authority or right to forgive sins because he is the Lord God Almighty. Well, let's try to bring ourselves into the story. Picture this scene in Jesus' house. The sun is probably shining on Jesus through the gaping hole in the roof. The paralytic is directly in front of Jesus with throngs of people all around him. The religious elite have just been called out for their unbelief. And now Jesus, before everyone, claims that he has authority over sins and he can prove it by calling this man to get up. I have to imagine that every single person's gaze is directly fixed on the paralytic, speculating to themselves, will this man get up, take up his mat, and go home? Can Jesus actually prove his claim over sins? I got to imagine that everyone is waiting on pins and needles to see what happens next. Well, verse 12 gives us the outcome. Look with me there. Immediately he got up, he took the mat, and he went out in front of everyone. As a result, they were all astounded and gave glory to God saying, we have never seen anything like this. His paralysis had vanished. His muscles had been restored. He could stand. He could bend over and pick up his mat. He could walk out of that building one foot in front of another. His friend's Uber service was no longer needed. That magic carpet ride was a thing of the past. This paralytic had been physically healed and everyone got to witness it, and everyone responded in the same manner, astounded, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Jesus, in fact, has authority on earth to forgive sins. Everyone was talking about it. Well, to land the plane, I want to give two final observations about this passage. First observation Jesus' miracle acts as revelation for us. For they not only attest to God's revelation, but miracles are in fact revelation themselves. They reveal to us the character of God. And this text clearly reveals through these miracles that Jesus does in fact have complete authority over sins. Jesus backed up everything that he claimed. This man got up and nobody could deny it. The proof was in the pudding. He has authority to forgive, and for those whom he forgives, he forgives completely. Friends, I just want to ask this question. Do you find yourself astounded that all your sins have been wiped away? Do you find yourself in the morning rejoicing that you stand faultless, blameless, and without sin before the Lord Almighty? We have no indication that the crowd was granted forgiveness like this man. They witnessed the miracle, but they didn't actually experience the miracle. But you have experienced the miracle for those that are Christians. And I want to ask you, does the, forgiveness of sin, does the understanding of forgiveness of sins, sins still affect you today? Does it still cause your heart to leap for joy and want to praise God for what he's done in your life? I want to tell you that it should. Well, our final observation from this passage, we have to ask the question, what was actually harder? As I meditate on this passage, I want us to consider Jesus' question about which is easier on a larger theological level. 
In other words, I think Jesus' declaration for the forgiveness of sins was in an ultimate sense harder than the healing. It takes more to forgive one sinner than to heal a paralytic. Now, I'm not saying that one required more power than the other. I'm simply saying that Jesus' declaration immediately brought about opposition from his enemies. I don't think anyone would have been angered if Jesus healed this man physically. It would have been far easier for him to say, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. However, Jesus chose the harder route. He declared before the watching world that he was the divine son of man who had authority over sins. Jesus was not taking the easy road here. He was actually traveling down a road that would lead to his death. This claim would certainly lead to his death, but please hear me. Jesus actually was the one who laid down his life. He voluntarily went to the cross. Nobody took Jesus' life from him. In order for Jesus to stay true to his character, this paralytic sin must be canceled by a blood payment. The blood of bulls and goats were powerless to take away sins. So for Jesus to heal him, another sacrifice had to be provided. I heard this in a sermon earlier this year, and it stuck with me ever since. The paralytic was lowered down to Jesus for healing, but for this man to be forgiven, Jesus had to be raised up on a cross. This man was pronounced cleansed before everyone, but for this man to be redeemed, Jesus had to become the curse, enduring the cup of wrath. For this man to walk out as a kingdom citizen, Jesus had to die a criminal's death. Christ fellowship, what was harder for this man to be forgiven or for Jesus to say, take up your mat and go home? Well, God's plan to provide a way for the forgiveness of sin was the harder road. But please hear me. Jesus took that road. Jesus' statement in verse 5 paved a road straight to Calvary. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do praise you. We praise you that Jesus with joy went to the cross and he took on the payment that we owe, that we could have never paid. By Jesus' blood, we are healed. And we praise you that Jesus gives us what we need more than anything, and that is forgiveness of sins. And Father, I pray right now, if there is anybody who has not experienced that forgiveness, that you would open up their eyes to the goodness of the gospel, and you would save them at this very moment. Father, I pray that you would grant them forgiveness. God, do what only you can do. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Peter is going to come up and lead us in the Lord's Supper. It's a great privilege and blessing to be forgiven for all of our sins, isn't it? And the Bible tells us that that's possible because Jesus Christ was willing to be sin for us. He was willing to have the Father treat him as if he'd committed all of our sins. Uh, he bore that weight on the cross so that we could be set free from the penalty of our sins so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. What, what sweet truth that is to know that Jesus was willing to sacrifice for us as his people. And we have the privilege this morning of remembering that sacrifice as we take the Lord's Supper together. Uh, the Lord's Supper really is, it's a celebration, it's a remembrance, but it's a celebration as well. As we think together about the gospel, uh, really as we see the gospel, and when we take the bread, we see Christ's body broken for us, and we take the cup and we think of his blood shed for us, really those physical elements become for us a, a sermon, another sermon, whereby we see Christ and we, we recall the fact that Jesus died for us. This beautiful picture of the gospel is for believers. It's for those who are trusting in Christ and in Christ alone. And if you're with us this morning and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, we're very glad that you're here. Uh, but we do want you to know that this is really a special time for those who have turned for their sins and trusted in Jesus. And so if you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, again, we're glad that you're with us this morning. 
but this really is kind of a family time for us, and so we'd ask that you would not participate in this time. Uh, when the elements come by, you can just let them go by you and use the time to think about what you've heard this morning, perhaps to pray. If you're visiting with us this morning and you're a follower of Jesus, you have turned from your sins, you've trusted in him, and you have followed his command of obedience and being baptized as a disciple, publicly proclaiming your faith in him, we invite you to take the Lord's Supper with us this morning. Uh, let me ask those that are going to help us distribute communion come and prepare that for us now. I believe it's here. And while they're preparing that, let me read for us from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, this words of institution that Paul records for us there as we think about the Lord's Supper together. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 29. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Let's pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We've offended against your holy laws. We have left undone the things we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there's no health in us. Oh, Lord, have mercy upon us and spare those who confess their faults and restore us as we repent according to your promises declared to us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I love the promise of forgiveness that we experience as we take the Lord's Supper and think about that Christ died for sinners. Uh, in a moment, the, the men will be distributing the elements. So I'll distribute first the bread and then the cup. Please, when you get those, please take those and hold those. We're going to, we're going to take those together uh, at the end. So please hold on to those until the end, and we will take those together. And while they're being distributed, Dan Roper is going to play for us and just give us an opportunity to think and pray and get our hearts right with the Lord and consider, consider this wonderful act that we're participating in as the people of God.
For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he'd given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. And then this wonderful conclusion, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'm going to ask the musicians if they would come now. They're going to lead us in a wonderful song of response to our time of worship together this morning. We're going to sing about the power of the cross as we think again about the gospel and the goodness of what God has done for us in Jesus. And they'll lead us in just a moment. If able, please stand. As Bryce preached, the healing of the paralytic displays Christ's power. Yet before the physical healing, forgiveness of sins was given. This is the power of the cross, and we just celebrated that with communion. You and I now have access by faith in Christ to his power of salvation. Let us conclude our service praising God, singing the power of the cross.
Bain standing for our benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You may take a seat as we meditate for the final time, the preaching of the word, the Lord's Supper, what we've sung, and then Lydia will break that silence um, with the piano and we'll fellowship with one another. Let's go to the Lord now.